Hey guys, welcome back. And today I'm going to start reading the series I Am Number Four by Pitticus Lore. Reading is another one of my passions. I still will be doing toy reviews here and there as well, but I wanted to get into sharing this series with you because it is by far, in my mind, the best series of all time. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, we're going to be reading a couple chapters every video. And you can buy your own book and read along with me. I got this one at Half Price Books for $5, so they're not that expensive. Or I have it set up to where you can read along with me. So let's go ahead and get started. Nine of us came here. We look like you. We talk like you. We live among you. But we are not you. We have powers you dream of having. We are the superheroes you worship in movies and comic books. But we are real. They caught number one in Malaysia, number two in England, and number three in Kenya. They killed them all. I am number four. I am next. The door starts shaking. It's a flimsy thing made of bamboo shoots held together with tattered lengths of twine. The shake is subtle and stops almost immediately. They lift their heads to listen, a 14-year-old boy and a 50-year-old man, who everyone thinks is his father, but who was born near a different jungle on a different planet hundreds of light years away. They are lying shirtless on opposite sides of the hut, a mosquito net over each cot. They hear a distant crash, like the sound of an animal breaking the branch of a tree. But in this case, it sounds like the entire tree has been broken. What was that? The boy asks. Shh, the man replies. They hear the chirp of insects, insects, nothing more. The man brings his legs over the side of the cot when the shake starts again. A longer, firmer shake and another crash. This time closer, the man gets to his feet and walks slowly to the door. Silence. The man takes a deep breath as he inches his hand to the latch. The boy sits up. No, the man whispers, whispers, and in that instant the blade of a sword, long and gleaming, made of shining white metal that is not found on earth, comes through the door and sinks deeply into the man's chest. It protrudes six inches out through his back and is quickly pulled free. The man grunts. The boy gasps. The man takes a single breath and utters one word. Run. He falls lifeless to the floor. The boy leaps from the cot, bursts through the rear wall. He doesn't bother with the door or a window. He literally runs through the wall, which breaks apart as if it's paper. Though it's made of strong, hard African mahogany. He tears into the Congo night leaps over trees, sprints at a speed somewhere around 60 miles per hour. His sight and hearing are beyond human. He dodges trees, rips through snarled vein vines, leaps small streams with a single step. Heavy footsteps are close behind him, getting closer every second. His pursuers also have gifts, and they have something with them, something he has only heard hints of, something he never believed he would see on earth. The crashing nears. The boy hears a low, intense roar. He knows whatever is behind him is picking up speed. He sees a break in the jungle up ahead. When he reaches it, he sees a huge ravine, 300 feet across and 300 feet down, with a river at the bottom. The river's bank is covered with huge boulders, boulders that would break him apart if he fell on them. His only chance is to get across the ravine. He'll have a short running start, and one chance, one chance to save his own life. Even for him, or for any of the others on earth like him, it's a near impossible leap. Going back or going down or trying to fight them means certain death. He has one shot. There's a deafening roar behind him. They're 20, 30 feet away. He takes five steps back and runs. And just before the ledge, he takes off and starts flying across the ravine. He's in the air, three or four seconds. He screams, his arms outstretched in front of him, waiting for either safety or the end. He hits the ground and tumbles forward, stopping at the base of a mammoth tree. He smiles, 
He can't believe he made it. That he's going to survive. Not wanting them to see him, and he knows he needs to get farther away from them, he stands. He'll have to keep running. He turns towards the jungle. As he does, a huge hand wraps itself around his throat. He is lifted off the ground. He struggles, kicks, tries to pull away, but knows it's futile, that it's over. He should have expected that they'd be on both sides, that once they found him, there would be no escape. The Mogadorian lifts him, ah, lifts him so that he can see the boy's chest, see the amulet that is hanging around his neck, the amulet that only he and his kind can wear. He tears it off and puts it somewhere inside the long black cloak he is wearing, and when his hand emerges, it is holding the gleaming white metal sword. The boy looks into the Mogadorian's deep, white, emotionless black eyes, and he speaks. The legacies live. They will find each other, and when they're ready, they're going to destroy you. The Mogadorian laughs. A nasty, mocking laugh. It raises the sword, the only weapon in the universe that can break the charm that until today protected the boy. And still protects the others. The blade ignites in a silver flame as if it points the sky. As if it's coming alive, sensing its mission and grimacing in anticipation. And as it falls, an arc of light speeding through the blackness of the jungle, the boy still believes that some part of him will survive, and some part of him will make it home. He closes his eyes just before the sword strikes, and then it is over. Chapter 1 In the beginning, there were nine of us. We left when we were young, almost too young to remember. Almost. I am told the ground shook, that the skies were full of light and explosions. We were in that two-week period of the year when both moons hang on opposite sides of the horizon. It was a time of celebration, and the explosions were at first mistaken for fireworks. They were not. It was warm. A soft wind blew in from off the water. I am always told the weather. It was warm. There was a soft wind. I've never understood why that matters. What I remember most vividly is the way my grandmother looked that day. She was frantic and sad. There were tears in her eyes. My grandfather stood just over her shoulder. I remember the way his glasses gathered the light from the sky. There were hugs. There were words said by each of them. I don't remember what they were. Nothing haunts me more. It took a year to get here. I was five when we arrived. We were to assimilate ourselves into the culture before returning to Lorien when it could again sustain life. The nine of us had to scatter and go our own ways. For how long? Nobody knew. We still don't. None of them know where I am, and I don't know where they are, or what they look like now. That is how we protect ourselves, because of the charm that was placed upon us when we left. A charm, guaranteeing that we can only be killed in the order of our numbers. So as long as we stay apart, if we come together, then the charm is broken. When one of us is found and killed, a circular scar wraps around the right ankle of those still alive, and residing on our left ankle, formed when the Lord Charm was first cast, is a small scar identical to the amulet each of us wears. The circular scars are another part of the charm, a warning system, so that we know when, where we stand with each other, and so that we know when they'll be coming for us next. The first scar came when I was nine years old. It woke me from my sleep, burning itself into my flesh. We were living in Arizona, in a small border town near Mexico. I woke, screaming in the middle of the night, in agony, terrified, as a scar seared itself into my flesh. It was the first sign that the Mogadorians had finally found us on Earth, and the first sign that we were in danger. Until the scar showed up, I had almost convinced myself that my memories were wrong, that what Henri told me was wrong. I wanted to be a normal kid, living a normal life, but I knew then beyond any doubt or discussion that I wasn't. We moved to Minnesota the next day. The second scar came when I was 12. I was in school in Colorado participating in a spelling bee. As soon as the pain started, I knew what was happening, what had happened to number two. The pain was excruciating, but bearable this time. I would have stayed on the stage, but the heat lit my sock on fire. The teacher who was conducting the, the bee sprayed me with a fire extinguisher and rushed me to the hospital. The doctor in the ER found the first scar and called the police. When Henri showed, they threatened to arrest him for child abuse. But because he hadn't been anywhere near me when the second scar came, they had to let him go. 
We got in the car and drove away, this time to Maine. We left everything we had, except for the Lord chest that Henri brought along in every move, all 21 of them to date. The third scar appeared an hour ago. I was sitting on a pontoon boat. The boat belonged to the parents of the most popular kid at my school, and unbeknownst to them, he was having a party on it. I had never been invited to any of the parties at my school before. I had always, because I knew we had might leave at any minute, kept to myself. But it had been quiet for two years. Henri hadn't seen anything in the news that might lead the Mogadorians to one of us, or might alert us to them. So I made a couple friends, and one of them introduced me to the kid who was having the party. Everyone met at a dock. There were three coolers, some music, girls I had admired from afar but never spoken to, even though I wanted to. We pulled out from the dock and went half a mile into the Gulf of Mexico. I was sitting on the edge of the pontoon with my feet in the water, talking to a cute, dark-haired, blue-eyed girl named Tara when I felt it coming. The water around my legs started boiling and my lower legs started glowing where the scar was embedding itself. The third of the Lorian symbols, the third warning. Tara started screaming and people started crowding around me. I knew there was no way to explain it and I knew we'd have to leave immediately. The stakes were higher now. They had found number three, wherever he or she was, and number three was dead. So I calmed Tara down and kissed her on the cheek and told her it was nice to meet her and that I hoped she had a long, beautiful life. I dove off the side of the boat and started swimming, underwater the entire time, except for one breath about halfway there. As fast as I could until I reached the shore. I ran along the side of the highway, just inside of the tree line, moving at speeds as fast as any of the cars. When I got home, Henri was at the bank of scanners and monitors that he used to research news around the world and police activity in our area. He knew without me saying a word, though he did lift my soaking pants to see the scars. In the beginning, we were a group of nine. Three are gone. Dead. There are six of us left. They are hunting us, and they won't stop until they've killed us all. I am number four. I know that I am next. Chapter Two I stand in the middle of the drive and stare up at the house. It is light pink, almost like cake frosting, sitting ten feet above the ground on wooden stilts. A palm tree sways in the front. In the back of the house, a pier extends twenty yards into the Gulf of Mexico. If the house were a mile to the south, the pier would be in the Atlantic Ocean. Henri walks out of the house carrying the last of the boxes, some of which we never unpacked from our last move. He locks the door, then leaves the keys in the mail slot beside it. It was two o'clock in the morning. He was wearing khaki shorts and a black polo. He is very tan with an unshaven face that seems downcast. He is also sad to be leaving. He tosses the final boxes into the back of the truck with the rest of our things. That's it, he says. I nod. We stand and stare up at the house and listen to the wind coming through the palm fronds. I am holding a bag of celery in my hand. I'll miss this place, I say. Even more than the others. Me too. Time for the burn? Yes. You want to do it or you want me to? I'll do it. Henri pulls out his wallet and drops it on the ground. I pull out mine and do the same. He walks to our truck and comes back with passports, birth certificates, social security cards, checkbooks, credit cards, and bank cards, and drops them on the ground. All of the documents and materials related to our identities here, all of them forged and manufactured. I grab from the truck a small gas can we keep for emergencies. I pour the gas over the small pile. My current name is Daniel Jones. My story is that I grew up in California and moved here because of my dad's job as a computer programmer. Daniel Jones is about to disappear. I light a match and drop it, and the pile ignites. Another one of my lives gone. As we always do, Henri and I stand and watch the fire. Bye, Daniel, I think. It was nice knowing you. When the fire burns down, Henri looks over at me. We gotta go. I know. These islands were never safe. They're too hard to leave quickly, too hard to escape from. It was foolish of us to come here. I nod. He is right, and I know it, but I'm still reluctant to leave. We came here because I wanted to, and for the first time, Henri let me choose where we were going. 
We've been here nine months, and it's the longest we have stayed in any one place since leaving Morian. I'll miss the sun and the warmth. I'll miss the gecko that watched from the wall each morning as I ate breakfast. Though there are literally millions of geckos in South Florida, I swear this one follows me to school and seems to be everywhere I am. I'll miss the thunderstorms that seem to come from out of nowhere, the way everything is still and quiet in the early morning hours before the turns arrive. I'll miss the dolphins that sometimes feed when the sun sets. I'll even miss the smell of sulfur from the rotting seaweed at the base of the shore, the way it fills the house and penetrates our dreams while we sleep. Get rid of the celery and I'll wait in the truck, Henri says. Then it's time. I enter a thicket of trees off to the right of the truck. There are three key deer already waiting. I dump the bag of celery out at their feet and crouch down and pet each of them in turn. They allow me to, having long gotten over their skittishness. One of them raises its head and looks at me. Dark, blank eyes staring back. It almost feels as though he passes something to me. A shudder runs to up my spine. He drops his head and continues eating. Good luck, my little friends, I say, and walk to the truck and climb into the passenger seat. We watch the house grow smaller in the side mirrors until Henri pulls onto the main road and the house disappears. It's a Saturday. I wonder what's happening at the party without me, what they're saying about the way I left, and what they'll say on Monday when I'm not at school. I wish I could have said goodbye. I'll never see anyone I knew here over ever again. I'll never speak to any of them, and they'll never know what I, what I am and why I left. After a few months, or maybe a few weeks, none of them will probably ever think of me again. Before we get on the highway, Henri pulls over to gas out the truck. As he works the pump, I start looking through an atlas he keeps on the middle of the seat. We've had the atlas since we arrived on this planet. It has lines drawn to and from every place we've ever lived. At this point, there are lines crisscrossing all over the United States. We know we should get rid of it, but it's really the only piece of our life together that we have. Normal people have photos and videos and journals. We have the Atlas. Picking it up and looking through it, I can see Henri has drawn a new line from Florida to Ohio. When I think of Ohio, I think of cows and corn and nice people. I know the license plate says, the heart of it all. What all is, I don't know, but I guess I'll find out. Henri gets back into the truck. He has bought a couple of sodas and a bag of chips. He pulls away and starts heading toward US-1, which will take us north. He reaches for the Atlas. Do you think there are people in Ohio? I choke. He chuckles. I would imagine there are a few. <laughs> and we might even get lucky and find cars and TV there, too. I nod. Maybe it won't be as bad as I think. What do you think of the name John Smith? I ask. Is that what you've settled on? I think so, I say. I've never been a John before or a Smith. It doesn't get any more common than that. I would say it's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Smith. I smile. Yeah, I think I like John Smith. I'll create your forms when we stop. A mile later, we are off the island and cruising across the bridge. The waters pass below us. They are calm, and the moonlight is shimmering on the small waves, creating dapples of white in the crests. On the right is the ocean. On the left is the gulf. It is, in essence, the same water, but with two different names. I have the urge to cry, but I don't. It's not that I'm necessarily sad to leave Florida, but I'm tired of running. I'm tired of dreaming up a new name every six months. I'm tired of new houses, new schools. I wonder if it will ever be possible for us to stop. Chapter 3 We pull off for food and gas and new phones. We go to a truck stop where we eat meatloaf and macaroni and cheese, which is one of the few things Henri acknowledges as being superior to anything we had on Lorian. As we eat, he creates new documents on his laptop using our new names. He'll print them when we arrive, and as far as anyone will know, We'll be who we say we are. You're sure about John Smith, he says. Yeah. You were born in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I laugh. How'd you come up with that? He smiles and motions towards two women sitting a few booths away. Both of them are extremely hot. One of them is wearing a t-shirt that reads, We do it better in Tuscaloosa. 
and that's where we're going next, he says. As weird as it may sound, I hope we stay in Ohio for a long time. Really? You like the idea of Ohio? I like the idea of making some friends, of going to the same school for more than a few months, of maybe actually having a life. I started to do it in Florida. It was sort of great. And for the first time since we've been on Earth, I felt almost normal. I want to find somewhere and stay somewhere. Henri looks thoughtful. Have you looked at your scars today? No, why? Because this isn't about you. This is about the survival of our race, which was almost entirely obliterated and about keeping you alive. Every time one of us dies, every time one of you, the guard, dies, our chances diminish. You are number four. You are next in line. You have an entire race of vicious murderers hunting you. We're leaving at the first sign of trouble, and I'm not going to debate it with you. Henri drives the entire time. Between breaks and the creation of the new, the new documents, it takes about 30 hours. I spend most of the time napping or playing video games. Because of my reflexes, I can master most of the games quickly. The longest it has taken me to beat any of them is about a day. I like the alien war and space games the best. I pretend I'm back on Lorien, fighting Mogadorians, cutting them down, turning them to ash. Henri thinks it's weird and tries to discourage me from doing it. He says we need to live in the real world, where war and death are reality, not pretend. As I finish my latest game, I look up. I'm tired of sitting in the truck. The clock on the dash reads 7.58. I yawn, wipe my eyes. How much farther? We're almost there, Henri says. It's dark out but there is a pale glow to the west. We pass by farms with horses and cattle, then barren fields, and beyond those, it's trees as far as the eye can see. This is exactly what Henri wanted, a quiet place to go unnoticed. Once a week, he scours the internet for six, seven, eight hours at a time to update a list of available homes around the country that fit his criteria. Isolated, rural, immediate availability. He told me it took four tries, one call to South Dakota, one to New Mexico, one to Arkansas, until he had the rental where we were going to live now. A few minutes later, we see scattered lights that announce the town. We pass a sign that reads, Welcome to Paradise, Ohio. Population, 5,243. Wow, I say. This place is even smaller than where we stayed in Montana. Henri is smiling. Who do you think it's paradise for? Cows, maybe? Scarecrows? We pass by an old gas station, a car wash, a cemetery. Then the houses begin. Clapboard houses, spaced 30 or so feet apart. Halloween decorations hang in the windows of most of them. A sidewalk cuts through small yards leading to the front doors. A traffic circle sits in the center of town, and in the middle of it is a statue of a man on horseback holding a sword. Henri stops. We both look at it and laugh. Though we're laughing because we hope no one else with swords ever shows up here. He continues around the circle, and once we're through it, the dashboard GPS system tells us to make a turn. We begin heading west, out of town. We drive for four miles before turning left onto a gravel road, then pass open cut fields that are probably full of corn in the summer, then through a dense forest for about a mile, and then we find it. Tucked away in an overgrown vegetation, a rusted silver mailbox with black lettering, Painted on the side of it that reads, 17 Old Mill Road. The closest house is two miles away, he says, turning in. Weeds grow throughout the gravel drive, which is littered with potholes filled with tawny water. He comes to a stop and turns the truck off. Whose car is that? I ask, nodding to the black SUV Henri has parked behind. I'm assuming the real estate agent's. The house stands silhouetted... Sil silhouetted by trees. In the dark, there is an eerie look to it, like whoever last lived in it was scared away, or was driven away, or ran away. I get out of the truck, the engine ticks, and I can feel the heat coming off of it. I grab my bag from the bed and stand there holding it. What do you think? Henri asks. The house is one story, wooden clapboard, most of the white paint has been chipped away, one of the front windows is broken, the roof is covered with black shingles that looked warped and brittle. Three wooden stairs lead to a small porch covered with rickety chairs. 
The yard itself is long and shaggy. It's been a very long time since the grass was last mowed. It looks like paradise, I say. We walk up together. As we do, a well-dressed blonde woman around Henri's age comes out of the doorway. She's wearing a business suit and is holding a clipboard and a folder. A blackberry is clipped to the waist of her skirt. She smiles. Mr. Smith? Yes, says Henri. I'm Annie Hart, the agent from Paradise Realty. We spoke on the phone? I tried calling you earlier, but your phone seemed to be turned off. Yes, of course. The battery unfortunately died on the way here. Ah, I just hate when that happens, she says, and walked towards us and shakes Henri's hand. She asks me my name and I tell her, though I'm tempted, as I always am, to just say four. As Henri signs the lease, she asks me how old I am and tells me she has a daughter at the local high school about my age. She's very warm, friendly, and clearly loves the chat. Henri hands the lease back and the three of us walk into the house. Inside, most of the furniture is covered with white sheets. Those that aren't covered are coated with a thick layer of dust and dead insects. The screens and the windows looked look brittle to the touch, and the walls are covered with cheap plywood paneling. There are two bedrooms, a modest-sized kitchen with lime green linoleum, one bathroom. The living room is large and rectangular, situated at the front of the house. There's a fireplace in the far corner. I walk through and toss my bag on the bed of the smaller room. There is a huge faded poster of a football player wearing a bright orange uniform. He's in the middle of throwing a pass, and it looks like he's about to get crushed by a massive man in a black and gold uniform. It says, Bernie Kozar, quarterback, Cleveland Browns. Come say goodbye to Mrs. Hart, Henri yells from the living room. Mrs. Hart is standing at the door with Henri. She tells me I should look for her daughter at school, that maybe we could be friends. I smile and say yes, that would be nice. After she leaves, we immediately start unpacking the truck. Depending on how quickly we leave a place, we either travel very lightly Meaning the clothes on our back, Henri's laptop, and the intricately carved lower chest that goes everywhere with us. Or we bring a few things. Usually Henri's extra computers and equipment, which he uses to set up a security perimeter and search the web for news and events that might be related to us. This time we have the chest, the two higher, high-powered computers, four TV monitors, and four cameras. We also have some clothes, though not many of the clothes we wore in Florida are appropriate for life in Ohio. Henri carries the chest to his room, and we lug all the equipment into the basement, where he'll set it up so no visitors will see it. Once everything is inside, he starts placing the cameras and turning on the monitors. We won't have the internet here until the morning, but if you want to go to school tomorrow, I can print all of your new documents for you. If I stay, will I have to help you clean this place and finish the setup? Yes. I'll go to school, I say then you better get a good night's sleep. All right, guys, that's it for today, and see you next time for starting with Chapter 4.